Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Graduate School of Political Management's Legislative Affairs webinar. My name is Lauren, and I will be your moderator for the day. I'd like to go over some logistics for this presentation and address some commonly asked questions. All participants are in listen-only mode. To ask questions, please type them into the chat box at the right-hand side of your screen and hit enter. You may ask questions anytime throughout the presentation. Questions will be addressed in the Q&A section of the webinar. At the end of this webinar, you will be able to receive a copy of the slides and a recording of the webinar. Your panel for today are Dr. Stephen Billett, Laura Dubinsky, a current student, Mary Sloan, an enrollment advisor, and myself, Lauren Cottrell, as moderator. Dr. Billet is the program director for the Graduate School of Political Management's Master's in Legislative Affairs program. He came to GW in 2002 after an 18-year career in the AT&T family of companies. Steve joined AT&T as the director of government affairs for Maryland and Delaware in 1983 after working in the congressional offices of John Bess and Barbara Mikulski. In 1987, he moved to Brussels, Belgium, where the creation and operation of AT&T's public affairs organization for Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. At the SPM, Dr. Billet teaches courses in international advocacy and PAC management for a course in the graduate program he created and directs. Kevin Dubinsky currently serves as a defense con congressional fellow in Washington, D.C. He graduated with honors from Northwestern University and a bachelor's degree with majors in integrated science, advanced physics, and molecular and genetic biology, and a minor in business institutions. Igor subsequently graduated cum laude with a JD from DePaul University College of Law. Prior to attending the GSPM, Igor practiced intellectual property law in Illinois and served as an intelligence officer in the Army Reserves. He has served in various Army, including the 7th, 75th Ranger Regiment and the U.S. JFK Special Warfare Center and School, and has deployed to Afghanistan. He has joined us today to talk about his experience in the program. Sloan is your Enrollment and Admissions Advisor at W's Graduate School of Political Management. She assists you with the admissions and financial aid processes, making it easy for you to get started and to pursue your degree. Here's the agenda. Dr. Billet is going to speak briefly about the GSPM and its programs. He will then give you an overview of the Legislative Affairs Program. Then we move into our hot topic section of today's webinar, where Dr. Billet will talk about political polarization. He will then talk about his experience as a student of the Legislative Affairs Program. The person will then be handed over to Mary Sloan, who will go to missions and funding portion of the webinar. We then answer your questions in the Q&A section of the webinar. Steve, to speak about GSPM and its programs. Uh, thank you, Lauren, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, to give you a little bit of background about uh, the Grad School of Political Management and move to some more detailed information about the Legislative Affairs Program. The SPM, the Grad School of Political Management, has been around now for about 25 years. Uh, it's a school of applied politics, a graduate program exclusively. Uh, we are the leading uh, program in applied politics in the world, uh, clearly a pioneer in, in the arena. And this is all about teaching students how to operate effectively in the real world. It's, again, an applied politics program. We have three master's degrees, political management, legislative affairs, and strategic public relations, as well as a number of graduate certificate programs, the PAC management program, campaign strategy, online politics, public relations, and, and most recently, a uh, program in strategic governments that's offered in Spanish. Uh, next slide. The Legislative Affairs Program, in particular, uh, the program I direct, is an 11-course, 33-credit-hour program uh, that uh, focuses exclusively on legislative politics uh, in Washington. 
uh, the only master's degree of its kind anywhere. Uh, all of our classes are in the evening, Monday through Thursday, on Capitol Hill uh, at the Hall of States. Uh, the focus of the program is fairly simple. We show you how to work effectively in and around the Congress, uh, dealing with public policy issues. Uh, we teach you that by giving you a thorough uh, education uh, in the public policy arena uh, and within the processes uh, or in an examination of congressional processes. Uh, uh, what program emphasizes uh, the practitioner component. We obviously deal with some of the leading theories that are uh, important uh, uh, in congressional study. Uh, if you are interested in working in and around Capitol Hill, this is the program for you. Uh, certainly a number of our people work on the Hill. Uh, but we have a number of other students who work in the government affairs arena. They're speech writers, researchers, other legislative uh, specialists, and policy analysts. Next slide. The column is pretty straightforward in legislative affairs. There are four required courses, uh, politics and public policy, legislative politics, executive legislative relations, and a research methodology course. From that point forward, a student has options available insofar as uh, electives are concerned. There is a requirement that there have to, has to be at least two courses taken from uh, the political processes arena and two courses from the public policy analysis arena. That really isn't uh, very difficult to uh, fulfill. Uh, or the requirement isn't difficult to fulfill. We offer a thesis option if you're interested, and if, if you're really looking to work uh, on a congressional committee or develop a particular expertise, uh, it's one of the better ways to go. And about 10 to 15 percent of our students actually write a master's thesis. We require a comprehensive examination uh, near the end of the program uh, to make sure that you've uh, absorbed enough and you're able to demonstrate that you uh, have developed mastery over the topics in the program. Uh, I should add, too, by the way, that uh, uh, we're part of a big consortium here in Washington. Uh, if you find courses in other schools or within GW that uh, you find attractive, we encourage you to take those courses uh, and to uh, 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 expand your horizons uh, outside of the GW curriculum. Next slide. Thank you, Dr. But now we are going to take a brief break to uh, go into our first informal poll. We'd like to know what you'd like to learn in future webinar sessions. Please take a few minutes to fill that out on the right-hand side of your screen. The results will be shown after the poll has closed. Now I'm going to hand the presentation back to you, Dr. Billet, and you can speak about what the typical legislative affairs student profile looks like. Well, we have uh, an interesting mix of students in the legislative affairs program. Uh, I'd say about 80 percent of uh, our students are in their late 20s, uh, all of them uh, deeply interested in politics, political junkies as we call them, uh, but people who really think they they want to make a difference and want to prepare themselves uh, to do that with uh, what we teach them in the graduate program. Uh, there are a lot of advantages to uh, coming to school at George Washington University. We're a top 50 university. Uh, we are at ground zero when it comes to the issue of uh, being a part of the political scene. Uh, we are very well connected on Capitol Hill. Uh, we include, for instance, in our legislative affairs program, the only course I know of anywhere where a member of Congress actually teaches the course for us, the whole course, by the way, not just a guest lecturer. The classes are very convenient to you. They're on Capitol Hill, so if you're working up there, it's easy to get to class. If you're working around Capitol Hill, uh, we're on the metro line uh, up near Union Station. Uh, the electives that are available to you allow you a lot of latitude when it comes to fashioning a program 
to meet your specific career needs. Uh, we offer over the course of a year uh, 35 different courses uh, in just about every imaginable area you can you can think of. Uh, our faculty uh, come from the ranks of professionals by and large. We have an enormous number of people who teach for us who were in a specific policy area during the day and come and teach during the evening. Uh, we include people who are senior staffers on Capitol Hill, senior lobbyists uh, around Washington who teach in some of the public policy courses. So we're very pleased with uh, what it is our faculty is able to offer our students here uh, uh, at the Legislative Affairs Program. Next slide. All right, thank you, Steve. Now we're going to go into the next section of our webinar where we cover the hot topic. Our special feature for today's presentation is centered around political polarization. I just take a moment to remind attendees that if you have any questions, to so please enter them into the chat box, and we will address these questions in the Q&A portion of the webinar. All right, Steve? All of you know uh, Washington is in a state of gridlock, and we have been for some time now. Uh, and the matter of polarization and what's going on in the Congress is very interesting to lots of people. Uh, if you talk to your parents or you're talking to other people, you often hear the, the expression, gee, why can't they just get along? Why can't these folks find compromise and address some of these very real issues in America? Uh, the reasons for our current state of affairs are various. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Lauren. See, the state of polarization has created some really significant challenges for the leadership in the Congress and certainly the leadership in the White House. Uh, we, we seem to be in a very rigid state of affairs where neither of the political parties is able to move much. Uh, neither is able to reach compromise. And again, many people are sitting around saying, gee, what's going on here? What's wrong with this Congress? And as a practical matter, uh, we're in a situation that would be very difficult to unwind just at this point. Because when you think about polarization, one of the things that we have come to understand is that it's been caused by a number of factors, uh, important uh, historical events that have driven us to this particular point, a point where the Republican Party is now represented in the Congress by a very narrow uh, theological group. We've seen something similar take place on the Democratic side, where, again, perhaps not quite as narrow uh, uh, an ideological group on the part of the Democrats, but one which is profoundly liberal, much more liberal than it has been uh, in recent decades. Factors that really make this difficult to unwind for us are several, uh, one of which has to do with the alignment of, of congressional districts in the House and Senate, the predominant ideology uh, of the different political parties, and this is especially true in the South, where uh, the bounce of power over the last several decades has shifted to the, uh, a more conservative Republican uh, orientation. It's become very difficult for people in the South who previously were uh, represented by some conservative centrist Democrats to form a, a basis for compromise within the institution. A problem that we have is the way our primary system works. Practical matter: the people that control the primary system in the United States are ideologues, people from the fringes of both of the major parties, uh, and they tend to favor and encourage the candidacy of people who represent their particular ideologies. So, what we've seen over the course of the last several years is a movement away from the center, where the Republicans are nominating more and more candidates who are even more and more conservative, and a similar trend on the part of the Democrats. And the way we've come to lobby in Washington has encouraged much of this polarization and has made it very difficult for interest organizations to move from 
from very rigid positions uh, and seek compromise to find a fallback position that allows the Congress to find a center of ground. The last thing that uh, is important here, I think, is the level of discipline that we've seen develop within the political parties. We now have highly disciplined political parties in both uh, the Democratic and Republican side, especially in the House. So the leadership is now able to bring their parties together and hold those votes uh, in one place. You don't see many Republicans voting in favor of a Democrat position. You don't see many Democrats voting in favor of a Republican position. So we end up with polarization, and there's not much latitude available to either side. Slide. If you're interested in these kinds of topics, obviously polarization is one of those issues that we spend an awful lot of time uh, on in our classrooms. Uh, we teach courses that touch on it or that actually take a deep dive into the issue. Uh, the courses listed here are a few of them. There's an interest group politics course where we examine how the lobbyists deal with this, obviously a course in legislative politics. The executive legislative relations course examines the, the, the effect of polarization on the relationship between the legislature and the executive. Obviously, our political parties course and our media politics course also examine this issue. Next slide. Uh, thank you, Dr. Billet. And I'd like to introduce Igor, who's going to speak about his experience in the pro program. Hi, I'm uh, glad to be here with you guys today uh, to share my experience and answer some of your questions. Um, I'm to throw about myself and how I got to uh, GW. Uh, basically, I graduated college, uh, then law school, and worked as an attorney in Chicago. Um, after I uh, mobilized on several tours as a military officer, I was in the reserves. Uh, the police came back and, and continued working as an attorney and was involved in local politics. I uh, interested in getting involved in more in national politics and uh, moving out to D.C. and getting more, uh, more involved in that. And so um, I was selected by the Army for the Army Congressional Fellowship, which as part of that fellowship, uh, the Army sends uh, several officers to GW to get a master's in GSBM as kind of a preparation uh, to work on the Hill. Um, and really know what, what to do and get things done on the hill. started the program in, in May of 2011. I'm graduating uh, this spring um, into uh, around the May time frame again. Um, <clears throat> just to give you a little background about how the program works with, uh, with your career and how it helps to streamline and really facilitate your uh, career networking options. Um, so I work as a military officer between the Pentagon and the Hill, and then um, starting in January, I'll be working in uh, Congress as a congressional fellow. Um, one program really does is it helps you to understand how Congress works or why it fails to work at certain times. And uh, the process range from theoretical um, to give you an understanding of how uh, things work and how they're supposed to work in theory, um, as well as where you can really make change if, uh, if you're in that position, as well as uh, how it really works in practice currently. And um, part of that is because there's a lot of students that are in the course that are currently working on the Hill in one uh, capacity or another. And uh, your classmates will be involved in, in everything from working with lobbyists, uh, consumer groups, uh, congressional aides, congressional staffers, um, work in uh, in a number of different positions, and they bring all of that with them uh, to classes, and uh, it helps you really to network on the hill as well as off the hill. And if you're looking for that uh, career change, or if you're looking for uh, assistance in whatever field you work in, it's uh, pretty helpful. So, for example, we have uh, we have staffers that uh, that are in classes with us. Uh, they present opportunities to come up on the hill, 
uh, they talk about what's actually going on in their offices, you know, at in real time. So that helps from a both well, perspective of understanding how Congress is working right now, and uh, from the kind of a future uh, perspective as far as where you want to go in your career uh, track. Um, stu uh, professors are, are uh, not just. Uh, you know, they don't just come from an office and, and, and sit in a classroom. They have a lot of real-world experience from before, um, as you know, that I heard from uh, Dr. Billet's uh, biography, but also uh, the current, uh, a lot of current involvement in politics as well. Um, come from from all sectors of, of the industry, from lobbying, from uh, being chief of staffs for uh, various senators and uh, congressmen. Um, other factors. So it really helps to understand not just how things work in theory, but really how they're working or how they've worked before. And you can really get a, a real world perspective of how things uh, operate. Um, also, part of that is there's a lot of connections that uh, professors and students have. And you can, as part of classes, you'll go up on the hill, you'll, help, you'll hold classes in committee rooms, uh, you'll talk to congressional staffers, you'll talk to uh, or star generals that have testified on the Hill, we'll talk to directors of the uh, Office of the Budget Management and, and other uh, government agencies to really give you that 360 degree uh, understanding of how um, the Hill works. Um, <clears throat> move to how, how you can apply that to really what you learn in the classroom to the workplace. Again, it's a great gateway in preparation for your political career, however that career is, whatever you want to make that, whether you want to go into politics or go to the lobbying field, um, or really just understand how Congress works and, and take that back to your uh, home state um, or home city. Um, a great way to meet people in different industries. Um, if you already can maintain networking relationships with, with your fellow students, and like I mentioned before, they're, they're all in different industries, so you can really get into there. Uh, another interesting uh, facet of this program is that most of the homework is uh, is papers, it's uh, essays or uh, research papers, but the topics of the papers are usually pretty flexible within the confines of the class topic. So, for example, um, in the political action committee course, you can really pick a topic of your choosing that deals with political action committees, um, and if, if there's something that you're doing in your uh, in your current work um, that that will help you uh, understand and, and do research in, in the class. You can put those together, which is a great benefit for people that are currently working on the Hill that are looking into certain aspects of uh, politics and want to understand them more for their day-to-day -day jobs. Um, for example, in the Political Action Committee course, we had a, a guy who was interested in, in doing a political committee and really wrote up the, the theory behind it in a paper, so it kind of helped them get both those, put those together. Um, balance school with other obligations. Is, is pretty flexible. Professors are pretty understanding. They understand this is a uh, exact type program, and how and uh, people working for the most part uh, full time. Um, so they're pretty flexible as far as uh, commitments. As I mentioned, most of the assignments are research papers, um, so you can really do those on your own time um, when you you have those free. Um, pretty flexible as far as deadlines as well. It's uh, you have plenty of time to do the papers. Their papers are in depth. They're uh, they're definitely graduate level work, no doubt, but they are uh, flexible as far as time, how you uh, complete that and uh, and when. Um, <clears throat> one thing I say about the program is it's it's really the, the only uh, type of its program that that exists out there, and that's why the army uh, sends its fellows to it because it, it gives you that theoretical perspective, and at the same time the Hands-on. Here's what you're no kidding going to be doing day to day, and here's where the here's where the pressure points are where you can make an impact uh, to really effective uh, after lobbyist, whatever your job is on the hill. So it's, uh, it's a very good and well-respected program. That, that's that's kind of why I'm here, and uh, like I said, it teaches you a lot of theory and practice, gives you a lot of networking capabilities, um, and helps you to understand what your involvement is on the Hill. I'll let you uh, answering uh, any of your questions further, and uh, 
Thanks for letting me be here. All right, thank you, Igor. Um, if you have any questions for Igor, please put them in the chat box, and he will be available to answer any of your questions during the Q&A section of the webinar. Uh, now we are going to move into the admissions and financial aid section of the presentation. Here is Mary Sloan. Thanks, Lauren. Um, you can see on the slide the list of admissions requirements, and it's a pretty standard um, set of requirements, so I won't go over each thing. There's just a couple things that I want to point out to you um, is that we do require um, transcripts from each university you attended. So if you've attended more than one undergraduate institution, you'll need a separate transcript from each of those schools that you attended. Um, and then item number three, three letters of recommendation. We do expect typically that an applicant will submit one professional and one academic re reference. But if you are somebody who's been out of school for a while and an academic reference would be hard for you to obtain, then you can certainly substitute another professional recommendation. Um, we normally advise in that case that you make sure that you pick somebody that can speed your potential to be successful at the graduate level, so somebody who can address your research ability, writing ability, things like that. Um, moving to item number five, GRE scores are required for admission to the program. There might be some circumstances under which you might qualify for a GRE waiver, um, and typically that would be an applicant who has a 3.0 or high GPA and then the three years of substantive professional full-time work experience, so things like internships and volunteer experience typically don't count, but the GRE waiver request form is available on the GSPM website, or you can also contact the admissions office for more information about that process. Um, each piece of the application is important, but um, it's important to just note that the committee looks at the application as a whole. Um, so if you have concerns about any piece of your application, um, contact the admissions office and we can look at your case a little closer. Um, you can move on to the next slide, Lauren. Um, applicants have a few extra materials that they're required to submit. The first is the TOEFL or the IELTS scores, and they are um, international transcript evaluations. So if you are a student who has a degree from outside of the United States, you're required to submit an official transcript from that university, but also a detailed course-by-course -course transcript evaluation. Uh, and the evaluation must be provided from an accredited evaluation agency, and there's a website it's called NACES, um, N-A-C-E-S, that you can find on the GSPM website that will list all of the agencies that we accept. Um, I urge people that are international students who are interested in applying in, to contact admissions very, very early in this process. It takes a very long time to gather these extra materials in addition to processing a visa request. So um, the recommendation is six months before the intended application due date, um, and that is really important um, uh, to know as soon as possible if you decide to apply so we can help you through that process. Next slide. Thanks, Lauren. Okay, funding. Um, you are planning on applying for student loans. You'll need to submit the FAFSA. That's the free application for federal student aid. Um, and today I recommend that you submit the FAFSA at around the same time you submit the application for admission to the program. So that process can take quite a long time. Um, and there are lots of other resources at GW for information about how to fund your graduate education. If you are a veteran or a member, a current military member, um, you would want to get in touch with the Veteran Services Office. Um, the link is there on the slide. Um, and they can give you information about the Yellow Ribbon and some other programs that you may qualify for. And then, of course, there are merit-based assistance and, and fellowships and things like that. Um, the biggest piece to take away from both admissions and financial aid is to apply early and ask questions. Um, the admissions office is happy to help you get connected with resources um, at the greater university. So if, if you need to get connected to any other office, we're happy to help you do that or to answer any questions um, that you might have. And then if you have additional questions, you can certainly ask me at the end of the um, webinar as well during the Q&A. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Mary. Uh, we are going to move into our second poll. Um, we will know what GSPM program you are most interested in. Please take a few minutes to fill that out in the right-hand side of your screen. And please also take note that we will be hosting a live webinar on the political management program um, later this month. A recording of the strategic public relations program um, that we did a webinar in early September can be found on our website at gspm.gwu. Dot edu backslash webinars. You are finishing up the poll. Um, we're going to address some of the questions that you have asked during the course of the webinar. Um, the question 
is for Steve. Is it common for your students to have um, internships or to be working during their time in the program? Uh, as a matter of fact, nearly all of our students are working uh, during the day uh, uh, while enrolled in the program. In fact, only a very small percentage of our students don't work uh, uh, otherwise. So uh, we've obviously developed a program that tries to accommodate uh, the fact uh, we obviously have our, our classes in the evening. Uh, we also try to be flexible enough to accommodate people who sometimes have legislation on the floor of the Congress and can't get away. Sometimes people have to travel associated with their work. So, uh, yeah, most of our people are working, and uh, we think the program really tries to reach out and accommodate that fact. Thank you, Steve. Um, Mary, we have a question. If the student is applying, a plan on applying for the fall admission, when do you suggest applying? And as far as the financial aid deadlines, are they different than the application deadlines? They are. Um, the application deadline for fall is June 15th, but the application deadline for the priority deadline for the FAFSA for federal loan processing is May 1st. So this is one of the reasons why it's really important to apply early. We do rolling admissions here. So if your application is complete um, at the beginning of May or at the end of April, it can go onto the committee and you can have a decision. And that will allow you to proceed on um, working on the funding piece of things once there's a decision on your application. Um, so the, the deadlines are different. And it's almost always that the financial aid def deadlines are before the deadlines for admission to the program. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve, this one for you. As far as the challenges with leadership that you're speaking about in the political polarization um, section of the webinar, does the program offer any courses relating to the relationship of Congress, um, legislation, and, and the military? Uh, well, we actually do uh, indeed have some courses uh, uh, offered in the military arena. There are uh, a couple of, and actually another that we're uh, considering adding. Uh, we have a defense policy course uh, that uh, we've offered uh, for a number of years. Uh, we also have a, a course that we just introduced last summer, Congress and Intelligence Policy, uh, since uh, our, and that obviously relates to the military, since the military now plays such a, a prominent role in the intelligence sector. Uh, in addition, there is a course on security studies uh, that focuses on the Department of Homeland Security. And we are looking at the possibility of adding a course that we think we'll call something like nation building, since our military seems to find its way into that arena, too. Thank you, Steve. And me. Uh, beyond what was spoken about in the um, admissions section, what exactly does the George Washington University and the GSPM look for in its applicants? So is it looking for previous political experience, or what is the thing that students are judged upon? Sure. Well, the committee does look at everything as a whole. I mean, certainly there are some minimums of the 3.0 GPA. Um, but the letter recommendation are also extremely important, um, as well as the statement of purpose. Um, the statement of purpose is one of the things I tell students is one of the only things that's completely under your control at the time that you're applying. Um, so it's also, in most cases, the only way that the admissions committee can evaluate your, your writing, your ability to do graduate level writing. So um, it's a good idea to focus on the statement of purpose and make that as strong as possible. Um, but also, certainly, it's a combination of your the strength of your recommendations, of your resume, statement of purpose, and your grades. Um, they really seem to look at things all in a all balance, all, all holistically. There. Mm -hmm. Okay. And for your, is it a balanced school with work and family? And how do how do you find it with the professors and flexibility of the, of the courses? It's flexible as I mentioned before. It's pretty uh the professors are very flexible as far as uh they understand that most of the students work full time. Uh most of the students have uh a lot of other commitments. Uh so the assignments are pretty flexible. You do those on your own time for the most part. 
and uh, professors are pretty accommodating. Um, so balancing, balancing schoolwork is uh, probably not that hard to balance that with uh, the job and the family. Like I said, the, the schoolwork itself is pretty detailed and pretty in-depth. Um, so that's the that's going to be probably more of the uh, challenge balancing it with something else is just really doing the work and um, doing all the research that comes with it. All right. Thank you. And Dr. Billet, um, what kind of careers does this degree feed into? Is it good for those interested in, in policy change and think tanks and lobbying groups, or is it, or is the political management program more suited towards that? Uh, so what kind of careers mainly does this feed into? Well, um, certainly we train people uh, to work on Capitol Hill in staff positions. They learn about the process. They learn about, in some considerable detail, information that's relevant to congressional procedure. They learn how to write legislation in a legislative drafting course. So many of our people are interested in working on the Hill, and many indeed do, in staff positions that range from a legislative assistant right through to uh, uh, chief of staff. Uh, in addition, however, we have a lot of people who come to this program who are interested in advocacy jobs, as lobbyists, or working in and around the advocacy arena for uh, NGOs or other politically related groups uh, that may have to do with public policy. So we have people who will be in an association, for instance, and work <clears throat> both as a lobbyist or perhaps as a researcher on things like energy policy or foreign policy or defense or you name it, frankly, where they, they do indeed get involved. Now, one of the differences between and the political management program is the political management program is much more focused on the campaign component of politics, and it's probably their primary emphasis. Uh, we obviously uh, deal with a number of those uh, topics and issues, uh, but uh, people who are really interested in working on the Hill tend to find their way to the legislative affairs program. Thank you, Steve. Mary, if a student's GP is below the minimum but they have great recommendations, can that help their chances with the admission into the Legislative Affairs Program? Absolutely. And the there are cases where somebody with a uh, 3.0 GPA is absolutely admitted to the program. The process can take a little bit longer because there's a second um, review process that the application has to get undergo. But if all the other parts of the application are strong, it absolutely does happen then, yes. Okay, great. And Steve, um, what is the graduation time frame? How many semesters does it usually take a student to complete it, and can it be done in a, a, a longer or shorter amount of time? Well, it's really up to the student uh, in most instances. Uh, if you go straight through the program and you don't have to worry about uh, working otherwise, it's possible to finish the program in as little as a year. Uh, that requires that you take a lot of courses and really focus almost exclusively uh, on uh, your schoolwork. Uh, we don't, as a practical matter, find many people who are able to do that. Uh, and uh, as a general rule, it takes folks about uh, uh, two years to finish the program, uh, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. And, much of this depends on the workload they have otherwise. I mean, if they're working in a congressional office and it's a very busy congressional office, uh, they may end up taking a little bit longer. Uh, in other cases, if they're not working quite so much, they may be able to double up a little bit, maybe take uh, a, a third course during uh, the semester and accelerate a little, little bit. As a practical matter, uh, most of our students uh, outside of the Army fellow who are on a bit of an accelerated program, uh, take two courses a semester or somewhere around that. That seems to be a manageable load for most people, uh, even if they're working Washington hours, which are sometimes quite long. Uh, but two hours is, seems to be the place where most people are happiest. Uh, thank you, Steve. 
I have another question for you. Is it possible to earn a joint degree in legislative affairs and political management? Uh, I'm not sure that you could earn a joint degree, but it certainly is possible to take courses from other programs and transfer them in. But we don't have a joint degree in place just at this time. Uh, however, you're in the Legislative Affairs Program, and you see some courses that might be especially interesting to you in the Political Management Program, you are free to take up to three courses over there and transfer them in. We're more than happy to have them. Uh, in fact, we've, we've always had a few of our students who uh, were intent on working on the Hill, but facing the the, the electoral reality of Capitol Hill, want to become more effective as possible campaigners since a few of them from time to time will leave Capitol Hill and then go and campaign on behalf of their members. So no, not a joint degree, but we do afford you the opportunity to get out there and take other courses uh, in the political management program. Okay. And for you, Steve, I have somebody that's interested in sitting in a class. Um, is, is that something they can do, and who should they contact? And can they take any courses before actually getting accepted? Um, well, that's two questions. Uh, anyone that wants to come visit a class, just let us know. Angela uh, Ferragamo is always very helpful in helping to set that up, or you can send an email to me directly, uh, and we'll find a class for you to, to get a little bit of a look of how we do things and how our classes operate more than happy to have people uh, uh, show up for our classes. And what was the second question again? Um, can I take any courses before actually getting accepted? Ah, yes. Uh, in fact, if you uh, want to give it a try uh, and weren't really quite certain that you wanted to go through the application process or the admissions process, uh, it's possible to actually take a course if you have, if you actually have an undergrad degree before the admissions process. Uh, it would be initially listed as a course not for credit. Uh, if, however, subsequent to uh, your, your taking the course uh, not for credit, you were admitted to the program, uh, we would transfer your credit into uh, the Legislative Affairs Program, and you would get full credit for it. There is one limitation here, and that is you can't do this for more than three courses. You can only do this for up to nine hours. Thank you. Uh, Harry, um, can you explain more about the GRE waiver and how it works? Um, sure. Will the materials that are submitted be forwarded and included in the application, or does everything need to be submitted again for the application? No, not at all. So what's required is the, the GRE waiver request form and then a resume and a statement of purpose. The statement of purpose is slightly different than the statement of purpose you submit with the application because it's really specific to your work experience. This is the time for you to explain in detail um, why the professional experience that you have qualifies you for the GRE waiver. And then we also need a copy of your undergraduate transcript. But if we already have an application for you and have a transcript, then we would certainly just use that one. Um, or if you submit a transcript for the purposes of the GRE waiver, we would just keep that and use that for your application. So you do not need to submit separate documents. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Steve, um, how significant is um, having your undergraduate degree in like a related field um, for your for the potential success in the program? Frankly, we we tend to attract a pretty diverse crowd uh, when it comes to the undergraduate experience. Obviously, a, a political science, a history, uh, an economics degree. Uh, may be more useful, but we seem to attract a fairly broad array of undergrad experiences. I mean, if you look, for instance, at Igor's experience, uh, he comes from a background where he had a lot of sciences uh, and has a legal background. Uh, and he, in addition, uh, we've always uh, attracted a number of attorneys to uh, the program, too, people like Igor and a number of others who are currently enrolled in the program who uh, uh, there's a whole lot more they need to learn about how Congress really operates 
well on their legal training. Thank you, Steve. And um, why did you choose GW and this program over all of the other programs in the marketplace? Well, uh, the Army's uh, got, the, uh, got an arrangement with uh, GW where they send their uh, uh, congressional fellows to the program. And the reason that they do that is uh, because it's really the only kind of program um, that's out there that's that's like this. It's, it's a hill. It really, really introduces you to how things work on the hill. And if you plan on working on the hill, it really helps you to not only understand how things work, but really see it in action and, and be able to, to be right there when it's going on. Um, most of your reading is uh, coming from what's going on um, week in the scope of how things are supposed to work, and most of your they address real world tests that are going on. So, really, why the the Army sends its uh, its fellows to this program is because any other school has anything like it, and um, it, that that's really been my experience with the program. Is it's, it tries to be the at the forefront of what's going on and how it should be going on. And I think that's why. Um, you know, the Army fellows um, are sent to this program. Right, thank you. Uh, and and Steve, does DSPM help people um, get with jobs or internships? Absolutely. Uh, one of the great features we have here is a career director who works with our students to help them with their resumes to. Uh, make suggestions about uh, career strategy. Uh, uh, she's very active uh, and has a fabulous background. Uh, she worked on the Hill for a number of years, for eight years. She is also uh, uh, has, uh, I think, a similar number of years as a headhunter here in Washington. So she really understands uh, uh, Washington job market and how how people can be successful. So she is very, very good at that, very good at helping people prepare them to enter the job market. Uh, in addition, uh, she is where she is, and because the GFPM and the Legislative Affairs Program is what it is, uh, programs that are uh, quite unique uh, and train people in very specific ways, uh, we have a lot of people bring us jobs or job opportunities that uh, we then pass along to our our students. And uh, there are some very attractive positions that come through here, even down economy. Now, uh, we don't guarantee anyone that we're going to find them a job, but we sure do uh, uh, an auto work to prepare people to look and to look more more effectively than they might otherwise. Thank you, Steve. And on that same vein, um, Igor, is there a relationship with the GW alumni community and the GSPM students and alumni that you know that will also help um, prospective students and students get um, jobs here in Washington D.C.? There's there's a whole lot of opportunities. So every, pretty much every class that I've been to, uh, where as Dr. Bill said, students really bring from their workplace. Um, the opportunities for people to work. So every class I've been to, then somebody who said, "Hey, I've got an opening that we're looking for this position in the office. Uh, is anybody interested? Is anybody looking for a job?" Um, and then constantly over email from the greater W community, you'll get emails that say, "Hey, we're looking for uh, position X in in this office or position Y in this uh, lobbying group." Uh, so there's a whole lot of opportunities. It's actually surprising. Because uh, the economy being what it is, I've, I've seen a lot more than I would think would be out there uh, coming just from with GW students and uh, GW um, professors. And the uh, networking that, uh, that you do in class uh, you know, with both professors and, uh, and this really ties you into all those uh, jobs. You know, Just another example, we had a student in the uh, intelligence policy class who received an internship through uh, a class she had taken in, in um, you know, in intelligence uh, through somebody else or new, and, and, you know, they came to them and they were looking for a, 
uh, for uh, intern in intelligence, and she, she got the position. So there really a whole lot of uh, interaction and networking that happens just within the program itself and also from uh, from the great community. And alumni will uh, consistently send out emails asking for, hey, we need, we need this position filled. Um, know anybody or, or are you interested? Thank you. And Steve, one question. GSPM faculty available to assist students with their research papers? Oh, they certainly are, uh, and it's one of the things we expect uh, of our faculty, uh, uh, and they tend to be very engaged. Uh, uh, we are enormously uh, pleased with the faculty we have. They, they are more than happy to reach out and sit down with students uh, and discuss with them aspects of their career, research that they may be conducting. Uh, we're blessed. And obviously, the fact that we are where we are in Washington, D.C., gives us access to uh, a fabulous talent pool when it comes to teaching their just uh, uh, just in terms of the congressional staff that are up there working on committees or even members of Congress that want to give their time and energy to the program uh, really help to uh, uh, create a community and uh, a, a sense of help for the for the students involved. All right. Thank you, Steve. And with that, I would like to wrap up this presentation. Uh, if we did get to your question or you have any other questions, please feel free to email us at gspminfo.gwu.edu. Um, all of us would be happy to answer any other questions that you may have. Uh, so thank you for joining us today um, for our webinar on GW's Graduate School of Political Management's Legislative Affairs Program. And please stay tuned for our upcoming webinar on the Master's in and political management. Uh, note the important dates for application. Um, November 5th for the spring 2012, uh, April 15th for summer admission, and June 15th for fall admission. Um, please feel free to contact us with any questions or if you'd like to sit on a class. And don't forget to connect with us via Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you and assisting you in your graduate school decision. Thank you again for attending our webinar, and we appreciate your interest in our programs.